So um, in reading through the books, I made a, a number of notes on index cards, and one of my colleagues who's here this evening said, I haven't seen notes on index cards in a number of years. Uh, so uh, there's, there's too many things I'd like to ask you this evening, but I'll start uh, with one of the uh, quotable quotes that I, I liked in, in your book, which said that sales is a series of seductions. So I'd like for you to talk to us a little bit about the seduction process, sales in general, retail, uh, what you think is the process of seduction. Thank you, Kevin. Well, it's a big question, and I'm going to give you a long answer, unfortunately, because... <laughs> That's what we're here for. Okay. Um, when I reluctantly joined my uncle's jewelry business in Wangarei as a salesman, my father, who was an Electrolux salesman, was my coach. And the jewelry business was made up of people that usually were doing watch or jewelry repairs. And my father was sort of outside the box. So rather than being more interested in repairing the piece of jewelry or the watch, um, my father was more interested in making a sale. And having to sell vacuum cleaners, Electrolux vacuum cleaners during the Depression, he had to be pretty good at what he was doing because he'd knock on the door and if his opening remark wasn't sufficiently good, it'd be slammed and it would close in his face. But he quickly learned to put his foot in the door <laughs> and could talk himself in. And um, he had 10 steps of a sale uh, that stood me in very good... Um, it really made me quite strong and because I was um, a young boy with no expectations, I really didn't know where I wanted to go, I didn't believe I'd amount to anything, I stood there and listened to my dad for 23 years selling. Um, and, but those steps are still with me. And then when we started our own jewellery business, we took them to the next stage, I guess, really. And selling is a real art. It's basically a lost art in, in, in retail. And it's funny you go to these great firms like Louis Vuitton and Cartier and Tiffany's and the salesmanship is shit. <laughs> because the product sells itself because of the mana that it has is built up by the founder. Um, and because we didn't quite come from that, we had to sell ourselves. And we have a system now that was based on the American Freedman system, um, which means that every sales associate um, has to achieve certain results in a week. You can't be a drone in one of our shops. If you're a drone, you get a red dot. So in other words, how it works is that if you achieve the target you is set for the week, you get a gold star. If you achieve only last year's figures, you get a black dot, and if you don't achieve either of those, you get a black dot, a red dot at least, and the red dot stands out very clearly. Uh, so every week, uh, your figures and your dots are shown in the back office on a little tiny wall, and they're shown, and every sales associate has those, and everybody sees them. At the end of the month, you either get the same, you get the gold, you get the black, or you get the, the, the red dot for the month. And then all those each month are then whacked onto a big board in head office and you can see all the shops and then it, 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 it takes a percentage of everything and the shop either gets the red or the black or the gold for the month. And of course the red ones stand out like measles or the ones that need attention, you see, so they do get more attention. So, so this, this, the system works like this, that if you're continuing to red dot, then we need to give you more training and then the training becomes more intense. And the system is quite complex but quite simple. Um, and the art of selling um, is, a, staged, is a, a lot of stages. Before I leave the Friedman system, which we, we, we have slightly changed, you're on the items per sale per hour the number of add-ons you make in that sale and the average sale you make. And usually you will find that 
If there's a weakness, it's going to show up in one of those of what they're not doing. <clears throat> the best way to train people in selling is to reenact a sale once it's happened. So the secret is that if the shop is not busy, and if it's quite easy to see how the, t the shop's going. You can stand outside, and if somebody's in that shop, and everybody's focused on them, even though they're pretending to do something else, you know they're engaged. But if you look there, and somebody's selling, say, a ring here, and the others are polishing some jewelry and having a chat over here, and this one's not taking a bit of notice, you know the thing's not working at all. So in a role play, you reenact the sale, whether it's made or not, and analyze it to death. So everybody turns around, we all, we all have the, the whole pack, the whole selling team's there, and then we reenact it to the degree of even how they walked in the door, who came in if there's a couple, who came in first, because the first one is, is usually the buyer, the second's the hanger on. You, you, you <laughs> learn all these things. Which window did it look? The window on the left or the one on the right? If it was the one on the, on the, on the, on the, on the left, it's the diamond rings on the, on the other side, it isn't. It depends on the customer play. It's quite complex. So when they come in, you have to be aware of everything that's happened, where they came to in the counter, what was the opening mark, you say? I think anybody in our company that says, how's your day been? Uh, and those inane questions that seem to be like, I came down on the lift the other day at five in the morning, how's your day been so far? <laughs> I could have shot the fellow, I mean really, it was a, 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 those are bloody stupid comments. We don't want those sort of shit comments, we want proper comment. So you've got to come from the heart, you've got to think of something original that's going to spark a conversation. If you can't do anything, at least give a nice smile and a wave that you recognise them and that may be all that's needed. Because you see, when a customer or a peer come into the shop, they can easily be spooked. It's a bit like duck shooting, which is on at the moment. <laughs> you can be in your Mai Mai, and you can see the ducks come up, and you can stand up and bang, and of course the whole lot have gone straight away. And it's exactly the same in selling in the shop. So if you're in the wrong position in the shop, you're at a huge disadvantage. If you're out the back part of the shop, and you have to walk up to the customer, you're going to spook them nearly 100% of the time. And they're probably going to turn around or either do a quick exit and they've gone and you've lost them. So what you have to do in a situation like that is you have to get like a, some books or the broom or something and walk straight past them. And get on the selling, get on the outside of them so that they, they, it's a little difficult for them to get out but they don't quite understand what's happening. <laughs> It's, it's the same as netting flounder, you know, you can, you, can, you can net your flounder, you can have them all in the bloody net, and if you don't put a hook in it and, and, and stop them, this end will all go out the end. So it's, a, it's exactly the same. So, so anyhow, they, you, you, you get on the other side of them, and then you're busy away, and then you might just give them a smile or something, or, and then uh, you could start up a conversation. That's the very difficult part, is doing the conversation without spooking. It's quite difficult. But once we've done that, and then we find out what they're in there for, nicely, and we, uh, it, it's all quite relaxed. Um, we ask them what they're in there for and, and discover this, this, the situation or the occasion, and then we, we work through the whole process, and then we come to the showing of the item. It's very important, the showing of any item, no matter what you're selling, is it's a very important part, so, we have a little stage, a little, uh, a little thing that goes on the counter, that goes under the light, and it's a, it's a nice a cream um, display stand there. It's, 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 it's there. And we get the ring out, and we, we hold it, and we, we disguise the ticket, and we hold the ring out very carefully, and we have a salve it, and just like a magician on the stage, we put it over the top and give it a slight clean, take it off, and hand it to the customer. Now the customer has to pick it up because if the customer picks it up, they're never going to buy it. So we, we, they, they hold it and we, then we put it on the finger for them, slowly put it on the finger. The weak salesperson at this time is rattling off that this is an 18 karat gold, it's got one carat diamond, it's a VVS color, that, that's right, and it's got a small occlusion on the side, set an 18 karat gold, it's got these side diamonds, where they've got 16 karat, and they go on and on and on, which is a load of shit. You should not say anything 
you wait for the reaction, because we don't know what the reaction is going to be, whether it's good or bad. But if the reaction is, is good, we can start speaking slowly. Should never mention the price unless the customer does. It's irrelevant unless the customer. If they don't mention the price, they're never going to buy it. It is of no interest to them anyhow. So on these goes, and they've got all these steps that carry on. And then you get the, the customer. You, you will do. You know, they, we have uh, several items out. When you've got one that's out, say after about three times, it seems to have come back to one item. We then box the product in one of our beautiful new pink boxes. So we put it in that beautiful box with the lid open, all looking at them beautifully in the box there. This is what you call a, a, a trial close. Some must say, what are you doing that for, you see? So I mean, it, it can sometimes get a reaction. If not, it's standing there beautifully while we're showing the other products. If something else is better, we then swap it over and put that in there. And there's this questioning goes on. It's all fun. They're all having fun in Sydney. This is no pressure on this incident. And then you get people that dither. A lot of people dither. They just cannot make their mind up. You know, I mean, a lot of people can't make their mind about anything in bloody life anyhow, but we have to deal with that. So I used to have an interesting um, close. If there's a, a couple of in there and there's a, there's a guy who, they always feel awkward, the men in the shop, because in New Zealand, in Australia, it's different than in North America. But here, the woman actually knows where the ring is. She's done the homework generally, and she takes him into the shop. <laughs> so he's led in, and he's feeling very awkward to be here, but he knows this, this is, you know, he's it's going to get engaged, so he's got to go through this <laughs> agony. And he's standing there, and she's trying all these on, and it's in the box, and everything's looking. And you get a sort of a a sense after a while that it's possibly the right ring. And I find this quite nice, and there's Sammy standing, and I say, Sam, this is one hell of a day for you, and a very special occasion. A remarkable day, in fact. I said, I pick the ring up, I give it to him, I think, and I get her hand, I said, I think you should put it on her finger. Well, I tell you what, if it's right, the ring goes on and there's a kiss and a hug and that's it. If it's wrong, there's an instant reaction. <laughs> She'll pull back a finger and then listen, because this is where it smokes out the objection which we want to hear. Well, I saw one in the other shop which I'm going to try and again, or it might be an X, Y, Z, or there'll be something. It will tell you what's going on, that all the truth comes out. So this is when we can then, we can dig in deep and we can, we can, we can arrest that problem. And then people say, well, I'm going to have a look around, I'm going to have a cup of tea. They've been saying that for 40 years since I've been in the business. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's a sign that you can actually then start selling because then you need to do a 360 and find something totally different they're looking at because you're looking at a ruby cluster and that's all they had in mind but suddenly you show them a solitaire or one of my new signature collection with a little pink sapphire on the side and they fall in love with something totally different. So the customer really doesn't know until they try something on. So there's all these things that we go over. And then when you made the sale, you give them a card, you give them a name, you take, you take it for your, on the internet so you, you've got there for future occasions and on it goes. So when you do the, when, when the, when the, 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 you do the role play, everyone, packs around and we think of all the things, could we have done anything better in this whole pre presentation? You know, you could have a, a customer there and she could have a, a shopping bag full of groceries that's heavy on her arm and she's trying, I mean, how ridiculous is that? So we've got to free that up from her. If we can sit a customer down, uh, we're, we're going back to seats. It is it's a significant, once you've got a person in a seat, you've got them far better position than standing up. Um, they become very comfortable and, and secure and, and, and they enjoy the experience. But without going any further in it, the great sale makes a great customer for life. A poor sale could force one sale and we'll never see them again, which is shocking. And an insignificant sale is just a ho-hum thing like you get most where. So we have the opportunity to make a customer and a friend for life. I have made so many friends when I was selling. It was such an amazing experience to have people come in with pikelets and cream cakes and 
pikelets for morning tea and afternoon tea and come and for, see us at lunchtime. And it was just so much fun in that Wangarei shop when we started off there. And we, 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 we took the, the turnover from 225 to 1.3 million, which was, which was the, the national average was 200 then. So uh, it, it, was, it was amazing times. So selling is the lost skill. And at Michael Hill, we still teach selling as our main, um, our main uh, principle of, 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 of uh, and, and anyone who starts in the business needs to be able to sell. So if any of you ever wanted to join us, you have to, you have to start by learning the basics of the business and how to sell before you can climb up the ladder. And may I say the ladder's pretty, pretty big now because we've got so much expectation. I'm talking too much, I'm going back to Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't think you're talking too much. As a matter of fact, I want to compliment you. It's the first time in my experience that out of the gate we've called the audience ducks and flounders. Uh, and I have this visual of uh, the male ducks and flounders in agony. So um, <laughs> thanks for that visual. But, but on that topic of agony, uh, in, in our earlier conversations, you talked about your life as sort of a volume one, volume two. Mm. And the volume one included... Um, some agony, and out of that sort of was the catharsis of volume two. Talk to us a little bit well, about that. It's a funny thing, isn't it, really, in life that, um, I mean, my life is um, so extraordinary. It's ridiculous to think that for 40 years I couldn't see out. I couldn't see anything. And it was a bloody disaster. And then I have a house fire and lose everything except my children and my wife, and it changed me overnight. And it's a funny thing really though, that if you haven't experienced some awful times, or reasonably awful, not that bad really, if you haven't experienced some toughness or hardness, I think it's very hard to move upwards or onwards. And one of the fears I have, and one of the things I'm here tonight for is to perhaps tell you that you live in the most wonderful place, I think, in the world, here in New Zealand. We're privileged to be here, but the one thing you have to watch is that it is slightly easier than anywhere else as well. You may not think so, but it is actually. And because of that, we sometimes don't need to challenge ourselves or push ourselves to achieve your true full potential and you settle for something like else. So, uh, I've forgotten what the damn question was now. It was about the, oh, oh, the you first one, volume one, two. That's right. okay, Adversity okay, okay, okay. to okay. catharsis. All right, okay. So I tried the goal setting. I, I mean, I'd read Dale Carnegie, Earl White and, um, Nightingale, and I'd read all the books and listened to all the tapes. And I tried to goal set and I couldn't, I really just couldn't do it. But as soon as we had the house fire and I stood there that night watching everything I had go and uh, I, was, uh, I really had nothing else but the house which was insured but not properly insured. And um, that night I said I was going to write on a piece of paper, I was going to own my uncle's business or start an opposition. Because I never had the guts to do anything like that before because I th didn't think I could do it. So it was just a fear factor, but that pushed me to do it. And you see, when I was at school, Jack Glanville told me that I would never be anything in life. He was the deputy head of Wangari Boys High School, the maths teacher. And no, I was no his, grudges. <laughs> and he was the, he, I was the worst maths student in that year, you know, it was pretty bad in Form 3. But the trouble is I was bullied at school, you see, and I couldn't concentrate on any damn thing, really. And I couldn't wait to get out of school quick enough, and I wanted to be a constant violinist, and uh, 18 months of that, but then I was, my uncle put me into the family business because they thought I shouldn't be playing the violin. It was probably the right thing, actually, looking back. But, <laughs> yeah. But I really couldn't see out. And then after the house fire, I just couldn't see anything but a future. And I started goal setting. So I had a, I had a that we would have um, 
first of all, I wanted uh, one shop in Wangarei, and then I thought, well, we'll have seven shops. And um, by the time we had seven, I went public in 1979, and um, we had a crack at Australia. And then I had um, 70 shops, and then I had 150 shops, and then I wanted a thousand shops. So it's it's all it all became back to to goal setting, and goal setting is something that not many people do. I, I always have 30-year goals, um, and it's a funny thing, but if you can visualize what you'd really like to stand for in 30 years' time, and write it down on a piece of paper, and put an envelope and think about it, and then in a year's time look at it again and review it, you're allowed to look at it once a year but no more, it starts you on a track that very few go on. And if you have a very audacious goal, or a very ambitious goal, it's better to aim really high, because if we don't quite hit it, we're going to hit really high anyhow. But probably that's the best thing I ever did, was when I, the house fire went down, I could goal set instantly. So starting to do it is the most difficult thing. How you do it without a house fire, burn your house down, maybe that's the answer. <laughs> But no, no, seriously, but that, 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 that makes all the difference. So, uh, yeah, from then on, as I say, the second chapter started, and um, it's just gone on from strength to strength. And it seems to get better. I, I mean, I have so much fun. I mean, imagine being here tonight, me, talking to you. It's ridiculous. But, I mean, what an experience for me. And um, I hope the younger ones of you here, we can perhaps give something that helps you a bit. As I say, in the two volumes, um, um, which are yin and yang, it's uh, quite, quite extraordinary. And in that goal setting process, mm. I know that you say be very specific. It's not lose weight, it's lose this much weight by X date. But you also are a big fan of visualization yes. and meditation. Could you talk a little bit about visualization? Yeah, well, there's a few key steps, I think, if you. Um, um, in fact, I should probably, I've got these written down here, and I probably should just make sure that I've got them actually right because they're quite important. But with the goal setting comes a few other challenges because the moment you start doing it, and if you can write something down, and you become quite excited about it, and it does set you on your way, and it, 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 it frees your mind up because you see, the neck top computer is always trying to find out what the devil you're up to, and it'll obey any of your instructions. And if there's no long-term one, it's going to take the short-term one, so whatever it is. And it could be negatives, like me. I dwelled on the bloody negatives, so it's talking of the negatives all the while rather than the positives. But if a long-term one, the direction will be firmly set there. It'll, it'll be like a, a laser beam putting you towards it. You've got to want what you... You need to want it, though. You can't just put down a, a, a dream and, and, and sort of say, oh, maybe I'll cheat, can't be bothered. You've really got to want what you do. You really do. So the first thing I found out was that, um, that if I was going to achieve something, I needed, a, my, I needed my, my necktop computer um, to be um, properly focused. And by chance, I found that the best way to do that was I, I did transcendental meditation. And it's a bit like if you've got a computer with a, a virus, you reboot it and you can get it back to scratch again. And meditation does just that. And by practice, effortless practice, non-judgmental practice, I might add, one can occasionally come into a state of pure consciousness where we transcend into the true inner self, which is the state of infinite wisdom and when we're in that state of stillness and quietness, after that outwells a well, a font of information for you that before was disguised, or un or you, that you becomes uncovered. And if you have a goal, your goal becomes searingly 
clear to you. The other thing about meditation, I don't know about you, but certainly with me was that if I get under pressure and there's a lot going on, and a lot of you today are doing more things like some of you are probably on WeChat and Facebook and I can see a few texting away right now. And the thing is, we actually can't multitask. We fool ourselves. We can, but we're only giving 50% to me and 50% to the WeChat or wherever they are we're on. So we're not totally focused on anything. And I think that if one wants to keep things simple, which I think is important, that we should actually have a time of our peak learning experience to have the ability to switch off everything electronic for that period so that you can think. So meditation will clear it can be a quick fix if you're under enormous pressure, your mind starts whirling, you become frustrated. There's so many things you've got to do at the present time that you can't decide which to do. You're completely uptight, and all you have to do is go into the bathroom and sit on the toilet for five minutes and do your transcendental meditation and come out and the answer is quite obvious what you need to do. So that leads to the next rule of mine, was the 80-20 rule, which I'm a great believer in. You see, I've come to believe that the people who achieve greatness on this earth seem to work the least of all of us. And what they do, of course, is focus on the 20% of the things that's going to take them to their target and eliminate the other 80%. Easier said than done, I know. But with practice, we can at least cull a lot of things off that we do. And if you look at a week of what you do, what do you really need to do, and what could you eliminate? Because what I, what I found I needed to do was to eliminate it to give myself space, to give myself time. And if I could give myself time, I would have time to think. And if I could think, we could achieve greatness. And if you're in harmony, because you've got time, you'll have a chance to look out and, like us coming in from the airport, I could not believe the abundance of flax and native trees that have been planted on the side of the road and how beautiful they look this morning coming in the light. You know, and we can see the things, but we can easily be texting the whole way in and we don't see anything and we live in a, we live in a cocoon of a controlled society. The other thing I think we need to do, if you want to achieve something great, you have to walk in a different direction than anybody's ever walked in. If you copy, you can achieve reasonable greatness, but it's going to be very difficult. But if you tread and beat a new path that anybody's done, and in fact, this means trusting in yourself and having the confidence in yourself that you can achieve something quite remarkable. Because each one of you here, and me, and we're all different. And in that little uniqueness, if we can snitch what it is and take that and lead that forward, that's how you can achieve greatness. And in doing that, the next thing is make mistakes. You've got to make mistakes. If you don't make one mistake a year that hurts, you're not moving hard enough. You're playing life too safe. So I want you to push the boundaries of what you do and start making mistakes. But from those mistakes, I want you to learn your greatest lesson. Because until you make a mistake, they'll hurt and you'll learn severely from them, and it'll bounce you to a higher level that challenges you even further, but gives you invigoration to go further forward. So relish the mistakes, never make them twice, but bounce back from that to a higher level. There's a couple of other things, but those were the main things, I think. Let's just, just check that I've got them. Um, okay. Um, 
Um, no, that was not the one. Um, well, while you're digging for that, I might ask yeah. you another question. Since you're on the subject of challenges and mistakes, um, let's get you to talk about some of your whoppers. And I don't know what those are, but I know going into Canada was rough going. Uh, I know going into the U.S. has been a challenge. Yeah. Uh, even, the, even the entry into Australia, I think mm. there were some, some lessons to yeah, be learned. Yeah. So, so talk about some of the mistakes you made, how you bounced back from them, how that confidence, that resilience yeah. played well, into all that. Thank you, Kevin. The main, the main thing was um, going into North America because, you see, if we were going to have a thousand stores and we wanted to become a global chain, um, we couldn't do it in Australasia because we couldn't put that many stores um, and there wasn't the potential, sufficient potential to do that. So it meant we had to go somewhere else. So we chose Canada, I mean, very simply and naively because well, there's quite a few New Zealanders, we're similar to New Zealanders and um, it had to be a nice place to be. I mean, how stupid is that? Yeah, so that's, we did it. So, <laughs> so we, we shot up there and we got some spaces in Vancouver and um, we opened some shop and Emma Hill, my daughter, who um, she actually opened them. Um, that's another story about Emma, because she was no favoritism. She actually got the position by hard work. And she went up there and started, and we did the same as we've done the house. So we, nice fit out, prime space, different looking shop than anyone else, put our stock in there, and um, opened. And normally we would, would open with a, a, a sale, um, which was a mistake possibly, but we opened with a sale. And uh, normally in a sale in New Zealand, we'd probably take 80,000 or something like that. And I ring Emma in the afternoon, I said, how's it going, Emma? First shot, he says, Dad, I can't close, I can't close. No one's buying, no one's buying. I said, what are you taking? I've taken $1,200. He says, that's just shocking, I can't believe it. So it was like going to a different planet. No one knew us. Um, Canadians are very loyal and their family's loyal. If they've been with a jeweler 40 years ago, they're still going to the same jeweler and they don't want to take on someone new. And the whole thing was a different experience. A lot of our stock was not skewed to their liking. And uh, so, it, it was, so we learned some big lessons there. Um, but it's taken us nearly 15 years to get it right. But we have got it right now. And um, we have an Australian man running that who used to be in the Navy. Um, he's running that. He's doing particularly well. We've got 66 shops at the moment, and uh, within two years we'll probably have 80 shops, and we could be the number one player in Canada. So it's uh, so we, we've got it right. It's, it's really good. And then we thought, well we'll, well, we'll we'll try the United States of America because everyone says it's a great place to do business. So we bought some of the shops from the Whitehall um, jewelry chain that was gone into receivership. Um, uh, two months before the global financial crisis, which is bloody brilliant timing, I might add. So <laughs> we bought them at 70 cents of the dollar, and we thought we were doing really well. So anyhow, so we, we, we started there, and uh, that was a totally different planet than anything I'd ever experienced, and uh, the whole company. Um, yeah, there were days there where the staff were quite satisfied. We would take no money at all. It didn't matter. And we were horrified and we'd never had a day where you took nothing in Australasia ever and there these people are willing to accept where well, there's no turnover in a day like it was quite a normal practice so this wasn't going to work so so we had to restructure and change a lot of our stock and that's when we learned that we had to become a brand it was very apparent and it came to us very quickly that we had to be known for something. We could not sell the same as everybody else. So that's when I had to start designing my own jewelry collection. So there's the Michael Hill Bridal and Signature Collection. I have all these uh, collections of diamond rings uh, based on my love of music. So that if you go to the Queen Street shop, you can see them or Albany and places like that. So we've, we've now um, had to do that, which we didn't have before. Christine has done a, a, a collection on her, on a Totorary shell called the Spirits Bay Collection. It's based on that shell that girl guides will and they toggle their, their brown scarf and put up in the, and, and you, you, people wear them around their neck as a, a shell and sometimes have on the ring. So she's done a jewelry collection of those. Those are going particularly well. So we're having to do a point of difference. But the big difference is that 55% of sales made to jewelers in the United States of America are done on credit and you are the credit provider. 
So in other words, we have to become credit providers. Um, and they have no deposit normally. <laughs> it's, it's, it's unbelievable, really. And so they'll buy a ring usually around about, you know, the between two and a half and five thousand dollars on credit and take it away and pay that over 18 months, we hope. And that's the way we've had to start doing the business because it's 55% of the sales. But the interesting thing which we had no idea about is this credit is so powerful that in 18 months time you ring them back again, the, the, the client and say, um, well that, um, your, your engagement ring that you, you bought, and uh, congratulations, your next anniversary is coming up here. And you speak to him and say, and we've just got the matching pendant and earrings that go with that. And the good news is you can come and collect that and it'll cost you no more, you just keep the payment going. And apparently you keep that payment going for life. That, once you've got them in on that engagement thing, they're there for the rest of their life on anniversaries, um, uh, presents, for, on it goes, on it. It's, it's unbelievable. So it's such a totally foreign way of doing business. So we're trying to get our head around that. We've opened two shops in New York. They're doing quite well. But we're still not making anywhere near the money that we would make in Australasia. Um, the rents are very expensive. Um, there's so much competition. And whether it's the right way going forward, I'm not quite sure. But there's another brand we've started called Emma and Row. And we've got 10 of those going in, 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 in Queensland. And uh, they're going particularly well. They're based on a that charm type, like a Pandora type thing. Uh, but we've got a point of difference with those. And uh, we feel that we're close to be able to, to say that we can turn those out in quite big quantities and could easily have 300 of those in Australasia. And then we could, we could license those out and even have a crack at places like China and Japan and Singapore. And so, so this could be a, a much easier model. So I might get to my thousand stores in a totally different model than, than what we were thinking of because it's an easier model to, uh, to run. <laughs> you, you mentioned Emma, your daughter, who's yeah. now effectively in charge mm -hmm. of the organization. And um, I know there's some times that she thought maybe she was ready and the organization told her she wasn't ready and she stepped out of the organization and came back. How do you manage that personal tension between father, business owner, mentor? Difficult, difficult. Well, there's never any tension between him and myself, basically, because we've always been good friends and the whole family's and, you know, always, uh, we're always um, very open as a, as a team. But because Emmett wanted to go into the jewelry business, um, and I had a CEO, I couldn't really overstep him, so it was up to him to say that she could go in. So she applied and got refused. <laughs> that was very hard for me, I must say. It was very difficult. Um, but it made Emma stronger, so um, she went and did an MBA, and then she did an MBA, and she got the, the valedictory address and was on that MOOC course, and she did pretty well. And then she went to work for our advertising agency, which was a cunning thing. And she came back and she pitched for our account because we were ready to pitch. And so she's there with all the board and everything else. And uh, Lou Deegan of Sydney had did this thing there. And he wanted Emma to front the adverts like a Deborah Hutton, in, 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 which was not a silly idea really, but he'd heard that it wasn't going to get through. So at the last minute he changed his tack to not such a good one. So Emma presented this and the board um, declined that. So that evening at, we, Emma was told that, she, that, that they lost the firm's account as well. So I can remember poor Emma on the phone, you bastard, you bastard, what are you doing to me? I'm out, that was one of the hardest days of my life. But anyhow, she eventually got in and then she was chosen by her peers and of course now she's the chairperson, so I mean, it's really cool. It, Emma's a wonderful young lady, I'm, I'm very proud of my daughter. Uh, my son's very different, he's very artistic, he's like Christy, my wife. He's a sculptor, makes big works in court and steel. Um, but between the two of them, they, they're, they're, they have the, 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 the business for the future because uh, Emma's not artistic and Mark is very artistic and in all great brands, if we become a grand brand eventually, um, you know, we've got the artistic side with Mark and his wife Monica and there's Emma with her you know, business brain which is a, makes a great package going forward. And without that, I don't know whether I would carry on. I think I would probably sell out and do something else with it. But it gives you the encouragement to 
to, to carry on and, and, and make this become something pretty significant. The other thing we do, which is quite interesting, uh, which you might find interesting, that um, four times a year we have a family meeting. We've now been doing this for um, um, nine years. Uh, so we have our lawyer and we have our accountant and um, there's a proper agenda. And uh, so Mark goes and, and Monica, his wife, goes and, and Emma goes and um, there's obviously us. And we talk about anything we like, but we all talk about <coughs> the main thing, of course, is the jewellery business, which is our main interest. But then there's the golf course and there's the violin come and all the other things. And then there's their interests as well. And making sure that we all understand and we're working together to achieve the same goals. Because it's amazing the different values of even Mark and Emma, you know, I mean, they're, they're quite differently driven and, and getting everything in coordination. And I think one of the big mistakes a lot of people make, particularly when they've accumulated a bit of money, is that they don't do that. And then when they've gone, everything sort of just falls apart, really, and it becomes disenchantment and, 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 um, and even enemies. And we are a very close family, our best friends are our family. And I think by the open communication, we've all become much closer and we all work together. I mean, we've all got problems. I mean, sometimes they say, you're getting far too smart. And you think, maybe I am, so I better be careful of that. So, you know, you, you, everyone's, there's, there's, you know, we, we can all say what we like to everybody and nobody will take it as an offense. It should be, that's the way it should be, really. And uh, so we're all driving for a, for a better group of people, really, and, 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 and having a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks for that. I've, I've got two questions, but only time for one before I turn it over to the audience. So um, you talked about Emma getting the MBA, and for my MBAs in the audience, glad yeah. to hear that. Uh, but you also have a particular point of view about uh, the use of education and, and the need to be close to the cold face mm. and combining that. So that's one possible question. Or, in a completely different direction, um, I think subject to shareholder approval, you're looking at listing it on the Australian Stock Exchange, whereas you're already on the New Zealand Stock Exchange. So you can either talk about the education process or talk about what it's like to list on a different exchange. And it, it, at, the, at the face of it, it might seem like, well, once you've done one exchange, they're all easy, but um, maybe not so. Well, we'll ask the exchange one first. It seemed um, our business, um, some way regretfully, but our head office is now in Brisbane, in Australia. We have a very big manufacturing plant there. Uh, we don't do all their manufacturing because a lot of intricate work's now done in India, which is um, unbelievable, all under microscopes, putting claws the size of pinheads and making a beautiful job. And China's not far behind there as well. Those two countries are made. But we do quite a lot of setting, and uh, so we have quite a big manufacturing division. In fact, the biggest in Australasia. Um, so it, everything is set up there. We report in Australian dollars. And the other thing is our P is far too low. And I don't know, it's something, if, we, if we're listed on a bigger exchange, I'm sure we'll have a much better P than we are because we're, we're highly underrated as a stock at the moment. I'm writing and, down my <laughs> stock too. And, and I mean, uh, we, we shouldn't be where we are. So. Uh, and there's, it, it's too difficult for an Australian to invest in this because, I mean, they've got so much paperwork and bureaucracy to, to deal in New Zealand. I mean, they've got about a 40-page thing to share out whether they even want to list in a New Zealand, buy a New Zealand stock. So it'll simplify the whole process. So we're trying to get shareholders' approval, and if we do, we definitely will be um, floating there, and it could be as soon as um, this next financial year. I, I think it will be a, a good thing for us, I really do. And the other question was... The education piece, the coal face, oh, yes. combining a formal education with... Oh yes, oh yes, yes, yeah, yeah, well. Um, you can do a degree, and you can learn the theory of something, and I applaud you for doing that, I've never done it. It must be amazing to do that. But. You need to also have the practical experience. So it takes 10,000 hours to learn how to sell properly and to run a jewelry business. But if you do that with what you've got, then I think in this room, there could be some bright young leaders that would perhaps could join me in my challenges and we could train you up, but you still got to do the 10,000 hours 
to become one of the hot shots in our business. You see, our top people earn more than you would be as a lawyer in a partnership, more than any architect. Um, you could earn great money, you can earn huge money, but it's not the, it's not the money, it's the challenge of you would be seeing the world, running a, running a place somewhere else, running, running a country, doing amazing things. Um, uh, and I just, I just put that out there because I'd dearly love one of you to join me because I, it's a young people's world and you're the ones we should be. I shouldn't have to find someone that's too ordinary and make them famous. I'd like to make you people super famous. And uh, I see some great faces in here. It's interesting that um, in New Zealand, um, our best salespeople are now in our gold club. We have, we have different pl platinum club, platinum club, gold club, and silver club. A platinum club is uh, a million plus, and we've got one lady who's done two, two and a half million this year in sales, and she's Chinese. Um, we have a Russian lady, uh, Indian lady, um, mainly all Chinese. Um, Chinese Chinese are our best salespeople now. And a lot of managers are, are, are Asians. Our, our good managers are coming through are Asians. Um, I, I don't know why. I think it's because it's, it's, they've had it so hard that they, 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 they have to prove something. And that's why, that's the thing I say about you New Zealanders. You just need to be careful that these people don't, you know, because you're just as good, but you, you, you let them have it. But anyhow, um, I, I love Asians as well. And our best, uh, I'd say, um, most of our jewelry sales are coming from Asians now too. So we're, we're selling, uh, it's red hot. Asians love jewellery and uh, they love us. And my God, we're doing a lot of business with them. It's quite incredible, really. I've lost the plot of the question, but there you go. You're, you're on it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the perfect time to turn the plot over to the audience. Uh, I want to turn it over to the audience for any uh, questions. I've got a young lady here uh, in uh, the future right there asking you a question, Sir Michael. Hi. Yeah. And also China related activities in the bank. Yeah. Yeah, and just now you mentioned you had make some mistakes and don't be afraid to make You so I didn't hear that last bit. Oh just now you mentioned don't be afraid to make oh, yes. mistakes. Yeah, I'm very curious what's the biggest mistake you have ever made. <laughs> biggest mistake I ever made. <laughs> that's, a point. that's a very good point. Other than tonight. <laughs> no, no, no. Well the biggest mistake I think was um, you see I was so naive. When I got a board, I didn't know what a board was. I didn't know what people did on a board. It was hopeless. And uh, I didn't have the right mix of people on the board. And they, they turned against me a bit. They weren't very nice. And anyhow, they said, you, you, you should go into shoes. And they put me in the bloody shoes. And, um, and it didn't work. And so we had seven shoe socks in very quickly. And um, I was doing adverts on television. I'd go, hello, Michael Hill jeweler. Gold, gold, silver, silver, chain, chain, sell, sell, gold, gold, silver, silver, chain, chain, sell, Michael Hill jeweler. And then, hello, Michael Hill shoes. I've got these Solero shoes here, and uh, welcome to Palmerston North. And I didn't know where the hell I was coming and going. Anyhow, <laughs> after seven shops, we closed all the shoe shops and concentrated on the, on the core thing, which, uh, so we became too complicated and too complex. Complexity is your enemy. Be aware of it, be aware of it. Any fool can complicate anything. Keeping things simple is the answer. Thanks for that. On the back row here. You'll have to speak up. My hearing's not that good. Okay. Um, I have a question for you in regards to how do you actually motivate your salespeople? I understand you have the okay. bonus structure in place, the reward clubs, and yeah. the sales. But what other ways do you use to actually motivate? Well, we, we, have, we have bonus systems for everybody. So um, on, the, on the sales floor, once you've earned five times your earning, you're into a good percentage of what you take. So when they're gold starring, they're doing very well. Once the time they made Platinum Club, they're earning very big money. So uh, Platinum Sailor will probably be making about $120,000 um, per annum. Uh, the top girl who got the big, there was a prize for anyone who could do over two million, so she got actually a quarter of a million just for doing it. So we, we pay very well. Managers get a percentage of the whole profit of the shop, of their shop, and managers can earn more than, a, a good shop manager can earn more than a, a district or area manager, uh, which they sometimes do. We have a, a very good girl in Albany um, who's doing extremely well, and um, there's one in St. Luke's and another one in, um, 
in um, Manukau. They, these are very good shops for us where they, they earn seriously big money. And then once you get up uh, to a manager of a country, then, then you get bonus to course uh, on the whole executive team's bonus, but your, your area also gets, uh, uh, gets a, a special bonus. And then of course the head guy gets uh, the biggest bonus of all the course. So uh, yeah, like he's working for Air New Zealand or whatever it is, it's the same sort of thing really. Um, <clears throat> but there's the challenges. I mean, they, they, they have to perform. And if they don't perform, you know, they're really looked at. So, uh, and we're always trying to push ourselves and make sure that we have the best people. It's very easy to get people in the, com in the company to become comfortable, you know, and it's easy to accept people that are holding you back, but really they're doing you an enormous disadvantage. It's like the red dotters. It's very, some, if you didn't have the system like this, you could be repeating red dot, red dot, red dot, and you just, they're there like drones, and they sort of hide in the system, but they actually pull the whole thing down. So unless we can train them up, they really need, they're in the wrong career, they need moving on to a, a, and get someone that can, because if you have all gold, all, all gold stars in the shop, the shop's just gonna go crazy. Absolutely crazy. <laughs> it's amazing. Just here. Ah. Good evening, sir. Michael. Um, I'm Burrell. Yeah. Um, I trade currencies for a living. I just spoke to you before the talk. Um, I just wanted to know what was your overriding goal when you uh, when you started off the yeah. jewelry business? What was the overall goal, and what was the motivation behind that? Right. Well, I guess the motivation was that um, I had nothing. I had to have something, and. Um, I just had to succeed. There was no ifs or buts I was going to. I just had to do it. So I had to find a backer, and I found the backer. He put the, put the money up. He only wanted 20%, which was amazing. So it was an amazing deal. And um, in five years' time, I paid him back, and, uh, uh, and then we, we went flooded. So the, the main overriding goal was I just wanted to be... I just wanted to do something that was left a mark on something. I, I just, I, I had to do it. And um, yeah, so it was a big goal, but once we did it, it's a funny thing, you know, I never had any fear from that moment on. I mean, people said, you wait till you don't have a day where you take any money or you got the worries of this. Never had a fear from it at all. Yeah, we actually, we are control of fear anyhow. Fear is only what, we make all our own decisions, really, whether we're fearful or we're confident or it, it's, it's purely a necktop computer system, really. It, yeah, and it's just a matter of flicking a switch. I mean, I, I find it amazing, you know, I mean, I, I'm pretty strict with what I eat, but people say, well, I can't give up, you know, a teaspoon of sugar in my coffee or I can't give up dessert, so I can't do that. But it's just, just flick the switch and say, I'm going to do it, as simple as that, or can't give up smoking. You can give up these things in a flash if you really want to. And I think really one does need to be, if one's going to be really successful, you've got to, be, you've got to start putting a stake in the ground and doing some things that are uncomfortable and just do it. Because if you don't, you know, you're, you're going to wimp along, really. Thank, thank you for that. It was very inspirational. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I think studying at your father's hand, you had all the skills, right? Yeah. Your, yeah. your dad was an expert salesman. It was just the catalyst, right? And I'm not suggesting everyone go home and burn their house down, yeah. but whatever your own personal catalyst might yeah. be, right? But the silly part about it, if it hadn't been the house fire, would I have been, I mean, I had a nice lifestyle, I had a lovely wife, had two lovely children, we had a little boat we could row out and, you know, catch our flounder and catch a snapper for dinner, and I made my ho home brew, and I had sake as brewing in the bath, and I mean, it was lovely, we had a great lifestyle and parties, I think, would I have carried on doing that? Would I have eventually bought out my uncle and perhaps a couple of shops in Mongaray and a, and a little boat, and would that have been it? Could have been, could have been, but what a difference. I mean, the difference between that and what I'm doing is just indescribable, really, and I mean, I wouldn't be here for a start. I mean, how good is this? Yeah. Right? <laughs> Got a hand over here, yes, here on the end, and then back in the back. Hi, Michael. Um, thank you very much for the talk. Thank you. Jewelry is a, uh, an unusual part of the retail business. And yes. Zealand, we've had uh, you and James Pascoe Group as well, who've had international success. Mm. But generally, New Zealand retailers and businesses generally have really struggled to take their operations overseas and make a good go of it. Mm. So, so what are some of the things that 
those businesses aren't doing that they should be doing. Yeah, well, it's a quite a complicated question, question but in, in, our, in our position, um, the only thing that's going to make us successful from now on, if we want to become something you know, um, greater than what we are, and in fact, our, our next goal is to take the company from half a billion to one billion in about five years. So the only thing that's going to make a difference is that we can, we've got to walk a different path. So we've got to go more collections, more original product. So in other words, I like two thirds of our product needs to be our own. We've got our own watches. We sell about 65,000 watches a year, but, and we've got our own starting with our own jewelry, Christine's collection, but we need to grow on those. So what we need to put ourselves apart from the Pascos or whatever it is, who are selling exactly the same product as everybody else, that's on a slippery slope downwards because there's no end to people again to find a cheaper price to this or that because it's exactly the same product. So if we have different and create a product that's different, then we have the opportunity of standing apart. So until we become a brand, and when we do become a brand, then we secure ourselves as a, as a permanent platform. And that's the secret to our success. The other thing is that a lot of people are shopping on the internet now, so there's lots of, you know, it's changed dramatically. And people now will look at the site before they come in the shop. We don't sell that much on it. I don't think it's only about four shops worth of on the internet. But a lot of people look at it all the while. And they make their mind up whether they want to, to come and see or not. So it's, it's a completely changing platform. But when they do come in, the experience has got to be an amazing experience. So that's the other thing. So if we have the lovely product at the right price, very competitive, but nobody else has got it, can't get anywhere else, and then they have an experience which is overwhelmingly marvellous, not how's your day been and now yeah, take that or leave it, you know. Um, you know it, it, then, then it all becomes easier said than done, but that's, that's the principles for, for success for us. Yeah. Thanks. On the back row there. I know you just talked about how... Uh, well, light, light project a bit more. Yeah, that'd be you. good. Thank you. I know you, um, you said how you like Michael Hill's a very bespoke product. You like the experience. But um, with online, like, do you guys have a strategy to grow it from four, like, from four stores of sales? Um, yes, well, we obviously um, are, are pursuing growing that. Um, in the jewellery business is different from most other product though, that it's a product, fortunately, we're very lucky, that it's something, we sell the most emotional and probably sacred product that you can buy really, which is, you know, the, the keystone to life is, the, you know, is, is, is your wedding band and your, your engagement ring, which is such emotional purchase. And you know, the guy who goes and buys it on Blue Nile or buys it from the bloody warehouse, I mean, it's, got to be, it, it's not a good start, is it really? So, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> So fortunately, they want to come into the store and if they have a lovely experience, so we're very fortunate. The, the lower price products like, you know, the chains and the earrings and that sort of, that's what's selling mainly. So we're not selling too many of the, the, the but they, they get the idea of what they see for the bigger product and then will come in. They'll have their choice of shops to come in. Yeah, it, but it is certainly becoming more and more the while, there's no doubt about it. And uh, we're very conscious of it. Uh, and trying to get our site a lot better, could be a lot better than what it is. Mm. Yes, sir. Uh, so, Mark, well, you mentioned earlier on tonight that uh, your love of uh, the arts and the golf. Really, Thank you. really covered that in depth. Yeah. We know where your love of arts came from, but what about the love of golf? Where does that uh, originate? Well, that's very funny, isn't it, really? Because I don't like golf, it's going too much, which is that. <laughs> 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 because I built too difficult a golf course. But, uh, <laughs> but um, it's a funny thing, but you see, my parents used to play golf, and when I was at their state house in Man Street there, I, I, I formed an 18-hole golf course and put baked bean cans in upside down and formed the Red Star Golf Course and, and charged one and sixpence for the Bongare Boys High School boys to be a, a member of this course. And it's funny that that idea sort of stuck with me, so when we built our house in um, Queenstown, I, I, I put a green out the front um, and I got John Darby to design it, the golf course designer, to design that for me. And um, I, I built that with the, 
greenkeeper from Millbrook, and we had a lot of fun. And then I thought, well, I'll put another couple of greens in, and I can make a chip and putt. And uh, so we did that, and it, we, it, it was quite nice. And we had tournaments with Millbrook where they'd play at Millbrook, and we called my place Hillbrook, and they'd come and have a shootout on Hillbrook, you see. And, and we did that for Rally New Zealand to send children overseas on adventure trips. And so we did that for a few years, and then Mike Hoskin from, um, it was, it rang me one day from the radio, and he, he said, I believe you've got a chip and putt, I'm dying to come, looking forward to coming and playing next year. I thought, that sounds a bit wanky, so I rang up Derby and I said, could you put a, a proper serious par four hole in, which is our Dragonfly Lake hole, number six. Um, so we did that, and we were down there, and I thought, well, I said to Darby, if we're down there, it's a bit ridiculous having a deer farmer just down there, you may at least go back to the house. So we did that, and it was a lot of fun. It was also a lot of heartache, but we did it. And, and he said, why don't you build a full course? And I hadn't really thought about that. I thought, oh, I could do it. He said, look, I'll build you one for four million. No bunkers, very simple. Million for the irrigation. I reckon I can do it. So I shook hands, done. Didn't tell Christine. As you do. <laughs> $18 million later, we built it. <laughs> yeah, but it was the best thing I ever did. The, 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 it's amazing. The land is unbelievable. And um, yeah, it's such a special piece of land. And then, of course, I was up north and I saw Alan Gibbs' sculptural park and I thought, goodness me, this is amazing. Why can't I put sculptures on my golf course? And no one does sculptures and, and golf together. So we started putting some amazing art, and I've got those um, 110 wools by Lu Wong of Beijing from 798 of the art district, and I've got a few other big, I've got a big seated man one I'm looking at, I'm getting from Winchester in um, the UK, I'm going to look up next month, uh, a huge seated figure that looks realistic, it's quite amazing. But there's all these things we can do, and I'm gonna build a par three course, but the silly part about it is that um, Emma was running, is, is running the clubhouse too as, as well, and. Um, um, uh, three years ago, she said, Dad, do you realize you're losing $22,000 a week on this golf course? I said, shit, that's a lot. So anyhow, she's now got, she's, she's now, we're actually now making a profit. And um, yeah, it's a closed membership. We've got 200 family memberships, and that's it. We've got a waiting list. We've got seven on the waiting list. And um, we're going to eventually make it like an Augusta, uh, where we completely close down unless you're a member. Um, that'll be it, and it, it'll, it, it's, it's, it's a very special piece of land. And we have people that are members that don't even play golf. It's funny, I was at the clubhouse this morning to get that book there, and, uh, and there was someone there at, at eight o'clock who doesn't play golf. They go there every day just for breakfast and for lunch, and uh, it's quite funny, really, but we're very lucky to have that piece of land. And we've had the Open for seven years, which is the longest anyone's in the history of the 100 years of the Open, so uh, it's good, and it's nice to support New Zealand golf, which has had a hard time, and, uh, but I've underwritten it for that time, and it's cost me a lot of money, so thank goodness next year, Mr. Ishii from Millbrook's um, underwriting it, so I'll be quite happy about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, good, I'm getting queued with several more questions, but I do want to be respectful of your time. And, uh, and again, thank you all for being here, and thank you so thank much. You. Thank you.